Yep, definitely at the point of entrance where the water's getting in, causing this roof leak right here. Coming in right here at this keyway where the two shingles come together and running into this gap right here. It's because there's a little slope down. It's starting to rot out the decking. You got a real soft spot right here. This repair needs to be done. We're going to go through in this video, show you how to find roof leaks, some remedies and things to keep your eyes out for, as well as pipe flashing and just uh, the repairability of something, how to figure the repair, what you might need to do the repair if you're a DIYer. So let's get into this one right here. All right, so typically if you don't have wind damage or some missing shingle or a tree fell through, put a hole in the roof, you're going to look for quality of install, something like that. So right here, you can clearly see a dip. This call came in the other day over the garage, clearly over the garage where my truck is parked right here. And you can see a spot right there. So just looking at that, draw my attention to it. Make sure there's no other obvious damage anywhere right here. By the way, keep a note on the color of this shingle looks to be like driftwood, Owens Corning Oak Ridge driftwood. So anyway, we'll get back to that. Right here is obviously softwood. If you stood on this, you'd probably fall through. That's just gently pushing on it. So things you're gonna look for, where two shingles come together, they have to be offset. If they're not offset, water coming in this crack right here will run through the next crack. That's why it's offset. If it comes in right here, it's gonna hit the headlap of the shingle and still work its way out. You gotta have proper offsets. You also don't want nails in those areas. That's a common issue when you get nails right here in this general area. I didn't find any yet, but you can see where they're like raised up right there over time and they're rusting. If they're in that area, water's getting to them, they rust out, they cause a hold. You have a penetration right there. Those leaks don't show for about, I would say four, five, six, seven years on up into 12 years. That nail is penetrating through that asphalt, making a good seal. That nail is also galvanized. People say, yes, galvanized doesn't rust, but galvanized is a coating. That's all it is. It's a coating, like a zinc coating um, process over the nails so they don't rust. That will wear off. Then it rusts, then it shrinks and wallers. Somebody commented on that word. And then you have a penetration, a little hole where water's just dripping in. That's the number one issue I find after about, I'd say five, seven years to about 12, 15 years. That's when you see those leaks pop up. This is a little bit different. However, water's getting in because this keyway and it runs down a slope this way and then falls in in that next one like the very beginning of the video started right there and it makes its way in under this roof causing issues. Then it starts rotting out the decking, sinking down, causing more water to funnel into this area. It's not gonna flow off of this because it's higher here than it is here. This is a low lying area. Water seeping in, coming in and getting into that section. So repairable, is it repairable? Yeah. This shingle here, what I try to do, one, you want to see if they split apart decently, and you can usually just see with your finger. If you can pop them up in areas, and like some of these corners are already loose, but like right here, if you can pick something up and get a flat bar in here like that, I'm confident you can split these apart because you need to split the area apart you're going to work on right here and you need to put them back. If you're going to tear the shingle, you might end up doing this tire section. The other thing to keep an eye on, and by the way, I apologize for the wind, it's a little breezy out, is the amount of life left of the shingle. So you're looking at the overall granule coating embedded into the asphalt. If you see a lot of asphalt and fiberglass exposed on the edges and things like that, granules are not adhering, they're coming off. The sun will degrade the asphalt a lot quicker, shortening the, ex the expectancy of the life of the shingle. So when you see a lot of granules left, it's still got some life to it. Can this repair be done and buy some time for the roof? Absolutely. This video is not about insurance and try to turn everything into insurance. So for you, those of you that watch that, go find some other guy, you know, hounding Jake at State Farm for covering insurance. It's not what this video is about. This is for the DIYers, the how-to, the guys looking up how to find leaks, whatever the case. So back to the video. Just disclaimer. I gotta put that rant out there. People hate it. They say, bro, you gotta turn that into insurance. I would've got that bought. Yep. Okay, proud of you. So remember I talked about the color of the shingle? <laughs> Driftwood and other manufacturers' colors that are very similar shade to this are very common and never going anywhere. The reason I bring that up, somebody has been here and done a repair back here. Yes, when you do a repair, it may or may not bring it back to pre-storm condition or pre-leak condition, but this is like not even close. I mean, at least it wasn't red or something like that, but there's many other brown shades like driftwood, teak. Hell, even brown wood probably would have matched better than this. But at least try to get something close to the shingle color. I just wanted to point that out because, yes, this may be repaired and stopped, but it does draw an eye to it, especially if you are that guy trying to turn things into insurance. And inspectors will be like, well, that's repairable. We're not buying the whole roof. We're not even buying the slope. It's repairable because somebody did it right there. Try to make it look decent. All right, last thing I want to kind of go over right here is well two more things water coming down an edge right here 
there is not a set rule of thumb. Well, there's kind of a rule of thumb, but not dead. You don't have to hide the pipe. You don't have to have the pipe exposed. It needs to have shingles tucked under it, and shingles come across the top so water sheds perfectly off. Depending upon where the pipe breaks when you're roofing the shingles up, you can have it exposed. I don't have a problem with that, but I do not like to see nails on the edge here, because if you look at this, see that? You may not be able to see it from that angle. Lower it down, zoom in. All right, look at this. That is not a good sign. This is a good indication, a good visual representation of that galvanized coating is gone. Now the rust process is going to start here. And for it to rust, you need moisture, you need water. Water coming down the side of this due to surface tension, especially on lower slope roofs, it's easily going to wick under here and saturate that nail over time, wearing out the coating, the galvanized coating, rusting it out, shrinking the diameter of that metal shank that goes down through there, and leaving you with a hole. If you're installing pipe flashing, B-vent flashing, chimney flashing at the bottom, cricks, I don't care. If you're gonna need to penetrate or screw something through, pull the screws up and in a little bit. And people say, oh, hide it. That's fine, but I don't like hiding it right near a channel of water coming around the vent pipe here. What makes better logical sense to me, anywhere in this area, because this is diverting the water around each side. You don't need much holding this down. You do not want them far out on the outside like this, or you will set yourself up for a hole in the shingle, rusting out nails in an area where water can come in. That one's still gripping pretty good, but this one definitely not. And same with this, water can get into those. So just trust me, pull them up, pull them in. Use a threaded screw, it won't pull out. And try to just keep it around something where it's not gonna come through here. Me personally, I probably would have done it this same way as far as running this shingle under. I'm not referring to the nails because if you put this one down then put your flange down and then cover it this shingle probably only goes up this high inch and a quarter past the common bond of the shingle above it meaning any water on that flashing flange could easily wick off and miss all of your roofing and get onto your roof deck your black paper synthetic whatever you got so having this one drawn under my rule of thumb the headlap the back side of the shingle has to be past the back side of the boot uh, pipe here Okay, so if it's a four inch pipe, three inch pipe, whatever, you want the headlap side of the shingle, which is the part that's covered by the one above it. So th this shingle was attached here. You want that piece of headlap past the back side of the pipe. That's my rule of thumb. I don't care about cosmetic, because if you've got this hidden cosmetically, but your roof is leaking, in my opinion, that's a failure. If the roof is good, the roof is installed, it's dry, it's not leaking, who cares if you see a piece of flashing exposed? Now, if you want to put a decorative cover over it and glue it down, fine, I don't care. We're talking about functionality over cosmetic. In my opinion, cosmetic over functionality is stupid. You can do what you want with that information. One other thing I want to point out down here is a bottom edge. I've talked briefly over the years about the different metal on the bottom. This is drip edge. It's for a gable. It has a lip that comes out right here. You don't really want that. That is made for a gable end out there. There's apron that goes on the bottom. The reason they use apron is because it goes down into your gutter farther or over your fascia board farther. If you don't have a gutter, it goes up on your roof deck higher. It allows you to not have water wick up under. On that, I want to talk about not hanging your shingles down farther because water surface tension easily wicks right up under there and getting debris on that edge metal you can see and if you don't have a good uh, ice and water going down over the face whether it's over or under that you risk some water wicking back up under due to surface tension you hang your starter down a little bit you hang your shingle down a little bit when it heats up when you install it it'll curl down giving a lip for the water to run off of not going up under due to surface tension this drip edge is to go out over a gable not for a bottom apron. I just want to point that out too. And then the last thing I want to note, we're at a nine minute video. I get a lot of people asking what repairs cost. I can tell you, depending upon where you are, who you are, what contractor you're wanting to use, whether they're reputable or not, or if they're a chuck and a truck, a tail light warranty, you can vary dramatically. So we're just gonna go over some basics and some things you might need, and then what you value your time at, and that should get you in the ballpark of what you should pay or what someone should charge. That's why it can change dramatically. So if you're in Carmel, right down 40 minutes this way versus here in Howard County, dramatically big difference in price. 
I feel like contractors down there, they value their reputation and some contractors here don't value the reputation, try to get a job, charge a cheap price, get the job, cause a leak, don't have assets appropriate, uh, overhead and profit to cover callbacks and things. So let's get into what I would just look at this here and see what you might need. So looking at the bottom edge, roughly four foot, I'm just gonna eyeball. There's a sheet of wood, it feels like OSB or plywood CDX. And then you have a second sheet of wood, which should put me just above this. So we're going to think a four-foot piece of shingle section has to come out here. Then we're just going to briefly look by putting my weight over here. I see a rafter right here. You can see where it does not move, but the roof deck gives a little bit. So mark that. Press over. And we're about 24-inch center on center rafter truss here. So we're going to need to come at least from here to here minimum. I like to try to patch more, especially knowing that this is probably 3 8 plywood being thin. I'm not going to put 3 8 plywood in from 24 inch center just between two because it's not going to hold. It'll snap. In that case, I like to try to cross at least three. Well, here it's over right in between two of these. I don't necessarily want to go out farther over here and out farther over here because now you're talking a large section of shingle and patch when we're trying to get the leak stopped right here. So if you could get by with maybe a half inch piece of decking to cover this soft spot once you got it cut out and removed and it's going to hold the weight of somebody walking up here, that's the most important thing. So a section of wood. We're going to need at least one sheet of wood. So write down a piece of paper, we need a sheet of wood. Then we're going to need some shingles. So just looking about four feet down, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Just call it ten rows right here. So ten. 20 because you're going to need two courses. That's at least a bundle right there because they're probably 20 to 24, 20 to 22, 26, somewhere in that range depending upon brands. So you're going to need at least two bundles of shingles to do this right here. I would probably plan on a third bundle. That way you don't have to run back to the store if you're a shingle short. Then you can ensure you got enough room to come down and get this section peeled apart with a flat bar. Remove the bad piece of wood by cutting it out. It doesn't have to be a physical full sheet. Like so for example if you got a joint right here and it's kind of rotted into that you don't need to take two full sheets of wood you can literally cut out between rafters preferably at least crossing three due to structural strength here once you got those out drop your new sheet of wood in you're going to need some like a synthetic paper or ice and water to tie in or cover over your new piece of wood wherever your last section of shingles are if you can get it on top of paper fine if you can go the extra distance and just get it on top of the headlap of that row of shingles, then that's even better. Because if there ever is anything, it's not going to stay on the paper all the way down off the roof. It'll actually come off that piece of paper onto the top headlap of a shingle, eventually work its way out. So at least two passes, that'll get you over four foot. The shingles to put them in, nails to put them in, a sealer to seal it down, the tools to do it. So when people complain about, oh my god, that repair is way more than it should be, Ask yourself this, if you're a DIYer, a lot of you guys out there want to do it yourself, that's great. But things to keep in mind, your time, if you got a big, well-paying job, and you're going to take more time off work to do the repair, and it's going to cost you more time off work than the cost of a contractor doing the repair, it's going to set you backwards. If you get into it, you don't get it done in a timely manner, you have storms coming, and it causes more damage, then it's going to set you down backwards. This is just a brief overview of what it should cost you, or kind of idea of what you need to do the job and measure those or add those prices up, value your time, trash, if you're insurance, you got overhead and profit, uh, you got equipment, all kinds of things that go into it that also add to the cost of a contractor doing this, a legitimate contractor, I must say. So, I mean, around here, I feel like for this repair, I would say at least an hour round trip to get here and back, an hour to get it out, your wood put back in, and the few shingles. So I would figure a minimum of three hour charge if I was doing this, whatever your hourly rate is, just as a ballpark, doesn't have to be that. All of your material, your overhead profits, your insurance, um, I mean, insure vehicles like this, dump trailers, trash bills, all that stuff adds up. It's not cheap. Your time and diesel, the skill of getting here to do this. So that's something else. There was somebody on Facebook, I read a post, and it was actually pretty, pretty enlightened to people that don't realize what it comes into. So there's a contractor who's like, oh, you know, you can do it. This guy's like, well, I don't have a truck to do it. He's like, well, you can rent a truck for this much. He's like, okay, well, I don't have the tools. Well, you can rent my tools to do it. And basically through the whole process, by the time he added up all the tools, rentals he didn't have, the equipment and everything, it just it doesn't make logical sense to try to penny pinch. Now I get it. Sometimes people are financially burdened with it and they need to do it on their own. 
you can do it. Just be aware. Like I said earlier, if you got a high paying job, it may not be worth it. If you don't know what you're doing and you could get into more trouble, it may not be worth it. We're going long. We're about 15 minutes. We're going to wrap this one up. In my area, I would say some of the mom and pop companies around here could probably do this for, let's say, on the absolute low end, 350 to 550. I know some companies in the area can charge two, three thousand dollars simply because they don't want to do it. And supply and demand. If no one's wanting to do it, and a contractor says yes, but it's going to be worth my time to send a guy, dedicated repair guy, out to do this with all the overhead I just talked about and the skill and the knowledge it took that guy to, to learn to find the leak, diagnose the leak, and fix the leak, it's going to cost you supply and demand. Nobody wants to do it. You're going to pay for it. So I hope that gives you a little better idea. I don't really get into the money side of things on repair work, but I've been getting a lot of comments for it. So if you liked it, then please just give me a little shout out in the comment section. You want to hear more of the money side and the secret little phrase word here, just say, uh, let's say money, say money down below. And then uh, I know you watched it this far. I greatly do appreciate it. If you got anything beneficial out of it, give it a quick thumbs up, consider subscribing if you haven't. And until next time, be safe and we'll see you on the next one.